Well, so uh, I, I feel very, very strange because I woke up at uh, 3.30 this morning to go from the uh, countryside of France uh, to here, so I really feel jet lagged. So I hope you, you don't feel uh, the same, and at least uh, I'll be able to, 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 to be on time. So um, please help me uh, because I tend to be a little bit chatty. Uh, for those who do not know, Linaro is, um, is the ARM ecosystem uh, collaboration. So we have companies like uh, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Red Hat, uh, Cisco, Ericsson, Huawei, Nokia, KVM, NXP, TI, ST, well I stop. So many of those companies are either building silicon or building systems on top of that and we collaborate inside Linaro to produce things and to push uh, technology in, uh, in, uh, in uh, many different communities. And out of uh, the members, uh, there was a request to have a technology to, to, to sustain uh, uh, time-sensitive networking. We tried to do it uh, with the kernel uh, with uh, you know, 500 megahertz, 1 gigahertz CPUs and the result is that the latencies or jitter are not really consistent with what, what the applications want. And when you have, when the latency is uh, between 20 and 40 times what it should be and when the jitter is 200 or 600 times what it should be, even though we try to optimize, it does not look reasonable to think that we're dividing the figures by a factor of 50 on average. So that's why we, we had to find a solution on userland. And then why not uh, ODP, DPDK to handle that? Well, in, in the automotive industry, people have solved the problem for quite some time and maybe they already have uh, a, a TCP IP stack in userland and access the hardware through proprietary systems or proprietary methods. So why not having a, a, a standardized method that, that is valid for uh, everyone that is also consumable by DPDK, ODP, or even VPP directly? For example, one use case for VPP would be uh, uh, to have a VETH access, direct VETH access for container networking uh, and have and be able to, to, to have a very high performance. So we wanted to have a very generic solution, okay. Now zero copy, so why zero copy? If you look at the 100 gigabit uh, uh, adapter, that's 148 million packets per second, that's roughly 15 gigabyte per second, and that's roughly one DMA channel. So if you, if you have the ring descriptors along with packets plus what, uh, what was just described as uh, the virtual descriptors for uh, an abstraction of, of that and then you, you copy the packets. Basically you have all the four channels of, of the, 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 the CPU package that are fully used for that. So then for VPP you have the zero memory bandwidth to look for the routes and if you have one million routes then you, you really have a problem. So for the design we want to make sure that even for 100 gigabit we still preserve memory bandwidth for the real application. Secure, so uh, in the past we've been using UIO or things like that or VFIO, no MMU and in the context of Spectre and Meltdown, I would say that we, we probably want to make sure that uh, the memory is a, a very well protected subsystem. So let's not do uh, other, other, any way, other way than IO MMU. Use on network IO. So network IO is not about building a device driver. It's about just getting the uh, the packet queues and the packets themselves. Let's not initialize the hardware. If you look at the code, the code size for a, a, a real tech uh, adapter, uh, it's 10,000 lines of code. And out of those 10,000 lines of code, you may have 8,000 lines which are about 
the different initialization procedure for this particular flavor or this particular hardware revision. And you don't want to replicate that whole thing in DPDK, ODP, or VPP. So what you want is to let the kernel do what it's good at, at driving the devices, but let the user land capture the, just the data path. And if we want to have a, a dual stack, so that's the, which means that one port can be used by the kernel and a user land uh, application. So the, the very idea is you have net, net devs in the kernel that have rings and packets. And through some communication, what we want is to be able to, to have the rings accessible or visible in, in the user land and the packets also controlled through uh, user land. But w what we want also is that if you use normal if config or other IP route to commands that they can influence the, the, uh, the, the user land application. And if you, the user land application wants to change the MTU, it will just use the equivalent of the, the netlink interface or whatever IOCTL uh, you need to change that. So that's the, that's where the design goes. One way to implement was just described. Use uh, F XDP, and, and that's a very good solution. Now, we have another topic, which is, if you, if you go really high speed on the network, what about storage? What about the other accelerators for crypto, compression, uh, pattern matching? If you have a solution for network, but you don't have a solution for the other aspects of the, 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 the life cycle of communications, then you may just solving a, a, a part of the problem. So we think we need a, a solution that addresses IO in general from user land in a very generic way that can be applied to, uh, to storage blocks, to, uh, to crypto acceleration, to compression, etc. And also that, 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 that is able to handle all the IO models that, that you can find on Earth. And let's, let's talk about the IO models a little bit. So that's a typical uh, uh, NIC. So you have descriptors and you have packets. Usually everyone thinks of this model only. So you, you have a bunch of buffers, fixed size buffers, let's say two kilobytes, and that represents the packet memory. And then you have the descriptors, and before, before being able to receive packets, you have to state in each of those descriptors where are the different buffers. So that's the, the typical model. In that model, on a two megabyte huge page, you can squeeze 1,000 packets, 64 byte packets or 1,500 1, byte packets. You can squeeze only 1,000 packets. Now there are other methods which is common in, in ARM SOC's environment. You have this, uh, those descriptors, but you may have multiple packet arrays. This is not about queues, you know, where, where you have RSS, and when you want to distribute the load between different queues, that's a different topic here. This is about having, let's say, uh, packet cells that are uh, 128 bytes. You have packet cells of uh, 256, and packet cells of to kilobyte. What this means is that you can have multiple packet arrays and for a single flow you can have multiple packet arrays which means that if you're doing an IPsec of load in software or in hardware for a single tunnel you can have multiple packet queues. Well, sorry, multiple packet arrays that can be handled by different CPUs or different hardware blocks. So 
This, for example, in the uh, uh, IF XDP is not yet supported, but maybe th that was the, the discussion on the mailing list. Maybe th this the model can be extended to support that. It's yet not fully known. There is another model for, uh, for packet reception, and that's the tape model. So you, you have the descriptors. That's the only common thing in all those uh, packet I.O. stuff. And then you have an unstructured memory area. You have no notion of a, of a packet buffer at all. So all packets can are just put one af after the other or between, let's say, with some uh, placement rules. But the hardware decides exactly where it wants to place the packets. So in that case, for example, for a two megabyte uh, uh, area, you can squeeze 32,000 64 byte packet, which is a little bit more than 1,000. So those models, why do they exist? This model is essentially to be able to have parallelism on a single <coughs> tunnel. This one is, is to be able to beat the DMA transaction uh, bottleneck that we have on PCI. On PCI, on the Gen 3 times 8, you have roughly 42 million DMA transactions per second. <coughs> Regardless of its ARM, Intel, or whatever, that's a PCI limitation. Which means that if you have one packet equal one DMA trans transaction per second, your limit is 42 million packet per second. So if you have a 50 gig LAN card, which is in theory 74 million packet per second, if you use that model, you can't reach line rate. It's not because your, your software is, is not good. It's, not, it's the, the fact that the DMA transaction limit, the, uh, uh, the amount of I.O. you can do. So that's why those models exist. For transmit, we have the same, same stuff, and you have ways to, uh, again, to beat the, the DMA transaction uh, limitation on, on the output side. So, if packet was good, but we need more than just networking, and we need to be able to, uh, in, in, uh, to, to support all the I.O. models. DMA buff has been around for quite some time, but it's very well, it's well done for uh, large buffers uh, that, or even more than four kilobytes, but not for 64 byte packets and 148 million packets per second. If you use VFIO natively, you, use the, you lose the net dev support in the, the, the kernel. So we, we thought that VFIO MDEV, which has been introduced <coughs> by Intel to support uh, virtual GPUs in QEMU was the right underlying framework to support uh, user land IO for not only uh, uh, networking but also for uh, other accelerators. And by the way, the VFIO MDEV route has been, well, is being investigated by uh, Intel, uh, which is Sun Ming, Sun Ming Liang and Red Hat on one side, and Huawei is working on leveraging the same VFIO MDEV for uh, crypto device support. So, one thing we, we ended up doing is we separate the packets and the rings. We say that the rings are the, the entities that are managed by, by the kernel. Creating a, a ring, creating a queue can be very complicated depending on the hardware. So we don't want the user alone application to deal with that complexity. At the same time also, when, we do, when, do we, when you transition from kernel to user alone, you don't want to have an undefined ring. You may have an empty ring, but you don't want to have an undefined ring. So the idea was to, to keep the life cycle of the rings inside the kernel and just bring the packet memory handling in, into user land. And that's, 
that's what, what happens uh, for the, uh, the life cycle of, uh, of an application that, that use NetMDev. So first of all, we want to, to make sure that there is a limited uh, or zero difference from a code perspective when the NetMDev is activated or not in, uh, in the kernel. So if you have a, uh, a Fordville driver, if you load it, um, it will behave exactly as, uh, as if, if, if uh, the, 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 uh, let's say the additions, the patches were not there. But if you have this global enable parameter, then there is a little bit of change in, in, the, code, in the code path. What, what the change do is essentially make sure that um, we don't create security issues. So we, we make sure that the rings are page size aligned and uh, a number of things like that. Once the driver is loaded, we have to capture the, uh, uh, the queues in userland. So we do a set of configuration. Those configurations are coming directly from the Intel VFI OM Dev framework to build virtual GPUs, but we use it to create virtual NICs. We ensure that the transition from kernel to userland happens in a very uh, in a, in a smooth way, and we leverage a very generic VFIO MDEV uh, uh, framework to pass all the relevant uh, um, structures to control the, uh, the, the hardware. So the, uh, the doorbells, the, um, the different, uh, if it's a PCI device, the different config spaces, etc. So when the application starts, it's again, it's just using the VFI OMDEV uh, system call. So we have not defined that. That's already in kernel 4.10. We just make sure that we, 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 we added some semantics into, into the framework that, that is about packet queues and, and the packet arrays. And then the user land actually does the uh, allocation of memory in a way that is consistent with the different IO models we, we saw. And there is something that, that has to be done in this context as we're dealing directly with uh, the hardware. There is one thing which is a little bit complex and that's DMA syncing. So in some architectures, DMA operations are always coherent which means that you don't have to deal with cache uh, validation or flushing in, in, in those architectures. But most architectures are not like that. And you need to deal with that. And so that means that at some point you may have to do uh, uh, what the kernel does, but in a smarter way so that we don't lose the performance uh, by doing DMA syncs on every packet. You may want to do, like VPP, you may want to do DMA syncs on a, a vector of packets. So what this means in terms of code, we, we tried that on, uh, on a number of uh, systems, and that's the, the kernel driver code, code base, and that's the, the, the kernel and user on lines that have been added to actually do packet IO. If you look at the DPDK PMD for, for, for this, we're closer to 30,000 lines because it's replicating the same stuff. Well, here we're looking at a very reduced. Now, if we, if we look at performance, uh, so on this uh, 40 gig card, on the transmit side, we reach the, the DMA transaction per second rate. On this one, we don't know if, it, if, uh, if it's a hardware limit or if it's, if it's the way we actually handle the hardware. For this Chelsea card, we beat the uh, the DMA transaction per second because they have a, an IO model that allows it. And we know that we, are, we, we don't know how to properly drive the hardware yet. 
And talking with, uh, with uh, the Chelsea guys, we know that um, for the, the, the T650 gig card, we'll be able to receive and transmit at line rate. But that's, that's the goal to, for the next, uh, the next few weeks. Uh, yes. So, what's next? I think I'm uh, running. Uh, I'm, I'm good. We haven't yet pushed an RFC uh, because we needed to make sure that uh, at least it works. It was not uh, was not clear, and we really would like to talk with the uh, AFXDP guys. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to to talk. Uh, with a with a beer uh, later today, um, we we don't really want to say that that's the way to do things. We'd like that the the community finds a way that is acceptable so that we reach a certain performance level and a certain let's say genericity of uh, architecture support and also uh, maybe a go a little bit beyond the network. So this is really about discussion. Now, the kernel has no, uh, that's a per personal uh, <laughs> topic. Usually the kernel considers the hardware is good, uh, th that it drives it and that, that's, that, that's, that's good. But what happened with the management engine and all those stuff um, and the fact that GPUs have programs running on it, that uh, network cards have programs running on it, you can't really trust the card to not do DMA on any area of memory. So my, my, I would like, uh, we all always consider that devices should always be now uh, behind IO MMU so that whatever happened inside the device, the firmware, the software does not attack the kernel from outside. There is something else, which is uh, the coherent interconnects. So you have C6, you have OpenCAPI, you have Intel has, I don't know the name for that. I don't know if I should know the name for that, but <laughs> anyways, those models will radically change how we should build device drivers. Because for example, we always think that there is DMA, so we have, uh, a, a packet and we want to move that packet from the card to the host. But with coherent interconnects, you will just be able to pass a pointer and say that's the packet. And if you want to access just the header, you will just have, to, you will bear the cost of the header, but there will be no transport of all the packet from the, from the adapter to the host memory. Which means that typically we try to avoid scatter gather list and have uh, uh, tail room and headroom to be able to add tunnel headers. But with C6 and a little coherent interconnects, that may be totally useless. So I think this will change the way we do uh, uh, drivers. And Gen Z is uh, almost uh, multiplying the memory bandwidth by a factor of uh, six to eight. So this will also change how we'll see uh, memory. And because of that, I would like those ideas to be integrated in, in the user on frameworks. And I'm done. So any questions? Why do I create a bidirectional mapping? You mean the uh, the ring descriptors?
I don't see by directional. Sorry? In the middle. In the middle. Ah, yes, bi directional. Yes. Because uh, if you do a packet forward from port A to port B, when you, when you first get the buffer, you don't know. If, uh, um, well, you want to be flexible in the way you will be syncing. So you can allocate the, the, the buffers as bi directional and then do the mapping at the latest moment. But essentially what is important is that the IO MMU domain has to span all the, all the IOVA has to span all the devices so that one IOVA address uh, is valid for any descriptor that you will put it put into. I don't know if it makes uh, an in good English. For the packet though, for sure, also for the descriptors. Descriptors are different. They are as they are maintained by the kernel, they are, uh, I wouldn't say they, they are not in a, in a separate IOVA, but we can consider that they are in a separate IOVA on which we have a on mapping. But we don't control the, 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 the bus address of that because that's the kernel who decides. And when, when we map those, those areas from the user land, we never s specify the DMA or the, the bus address. We just specify a, a, a VFIOM dev I region ID, which will be then translated so that we don't mess around with uh, uh, addresses from the kernel. Okay, so we have no more time for questions, I'm afraid. Uh, Francois, thank you very much. Thank you.